Thank you very much. Um, let me begin, first of all, by thanking uh, my host for inviting me to this uh, conference. I think uh, it's a wonderful thing when one opens the newspaper today, one is impressed by so much evil that is done in the name of religion. And I think it's wonderful to have a conference to see the wonderful good things that religion that binds us, the things that we have in common rather than the things that separate us. That's number one. Number two, I, I'm sure that when Munir and Asim chose this date for having the conference, little did they know that Jews all over the world today, today is the Sabbath, the Shabbat, Jews congregate in their synagogues today, and as is their custom, they read from the Torah, from the first five books of Moses. And today, it just so happens, is the day where we read about God's choosing of Abraham to be the bearer of monotheism to the world and also the birth of Ishmael in today. So I think this was a very fortuitous uh, selection, uh, and I, I'm sure you knew that when you picked the day. Uh, I'm going to speak about something you've heard a little bit about already, lessons from a Gosace, uh, Rabbi Dr. Kinsbrunner. Everybody calls you Rabbi, why not Doctor? W which would you prefer? Well, yeah. Rabbi came later. So okay, <laughs> let's go, uh, well, I'll call you Dr. Kinsbrunner. Uh, spoke about a Gosace, and I'm going to speak about that as well and extrapolate a little bit on the concept um, and uh, why I think it really, we have a great deal to learn from this ancient concept. And I'm going to speak a little bit about some personal things, about my own journey in the field of uh, uh, medical ethics. I should say that I am a chairman of the Medical Ethics Committee at Columbia University Medical Center and have been for the last 20 years, so this is very much a part of, my, of who I am. 35 years ago, when I was an attending physician in my hospital's intensive care unit, I started to ponder the ethical issues involved in the use and the misuse of increasingly powerful medical technology. Twelve years before that, in 1968, during my internship, there were few end-of-life ethical conundrums. We treated every patient as aggressively as possible, always. Death was the enemy, and we employed every medical intervention to avoid the demise of our patients. Our technology was primitive by today's standards, and we couldn't prolong the process of dying significantly. A mere 10 years later, when I was an attending physician in the intensive care unit, medical technology had advanced greatly, and the lives of many ICU patients were saved by respirators, dialysis machines, and powerful new drugs. I soon realized, however, that there was a group of patients who could not be cured with these interventions, but whose dying was prolonged significantly with much suffering for both them and their families. I needed guidance in how to deal with these ethical dilemmas. As someone who took his Jewish religion seriously, I began reading articles and books on Jewish medical ethics. In the course of my readings, I came across a curious and a powerful statement that was written, written some 800 years ago by a Jewish scholar from the Bavarian town of Regensburg. Rabbi Judah the Pious, he wrote in Sefer HaChasidim, the Book of the Righteous, quote, Ein kofin adam shalo yamut mehera. We do not compel a person not to die quickly. What a strange but insightful comment, I thought. The rabbi gave an example. If a person is a gosace and someone near his house is chopping wood so that his soul cannot depart, one should remove the wood chopper. One does not put salt on his tongue in order to prevent his death. In Jewish law, a gosace, as you heard, is someone who is moribund, who is actively dying. In the 13th century, people had fixed ideas about the events surrounding death and felt that loud noises or the pungent taste of salt could delay that final moment when the soul departed the body. Removing the woodchopper was viewed as removing an impediment to one's peaceful death. I learned from yet another source written a thousand years before Rabbi Judah the Pious, the same principle that one should remove an impediment to a peaceful death. In the Talmud, the encyclopedic work of Jewish law or halakha, compiled over 500 years and completed in approximately the year 500 of the common era, 
The story is told of the death in the third century of Rabbi Judah the Prince, known as Rebbe. He was the foremost Jewish sage of his era, and he was suffering from an intestinal disease. Rebbe's disciples, overcome with the dread of losing their beloved teacher, but seemingly unaware of the degree of his suffering and the hopelessness of his terminal illness, continued to pray for his recovery. It was only Rebbe's housemaid who, seeing his torment and the inevitability of his imminent death, was determined to silence the prayers of his followers, which she believed were preventing him from dying peacefully. She cleverly threw an earthenware vessel to the ground. The noise of the shattering vessel stunned the praying crowd, so they ceased their prayers for an instant, during which time Rebbe's soul departed. Just as in the case of the woodchopper, the handmaid acted to remove an impediment to a peaceful and quick death, in this case, the prayers of Rebbe's students. When, as a young ICU attending, I first read these sources, I was intrigued by the idea that the wise scholar of 800 years ago, who could never have dreamed of our medical technology, had ruled that one must remove an impediment to imminent death, and that a compassionate handmaid, even earlier, had intuited the same humane pr principle. In today's ICUs, the woodchopper and the prayers of devout followers have been replaced by ventilators, dialysis machines, ventricular assist devices, and extracorporeal membrane oxygenators. Might not Rabbi Judah the pious, rounding in our ICUs today, be dismayed at how often his introductory principle, we do not compel a person not to die quickly, was being routinely violated by our modern day incarnations of the woodchopper. Whether because of the understandable grief of families unable to let go, or the injunctions of some rabbis that every moment of life must be preserved, or the poor judgment of physicians who do not recognize when the battle for life is lost, aren't patients too often compelled not to die quickly. Take the case of my patient Ben, when he was 88 years old, he came to see me for mild chest pain and brought with him an x-ray that showed a mass in his lung. His daughters requested that I not share with their elderly and frail father my diagnostic impression of cancer. They were a deeply religious Jewish family and it was their custom not to share bad news with elderly patients. Indeed, Ben was too frail with heart and kidney disease to undergo surgery, chemotherapy, or radiotherapy. He and his daughters had agreed, however, to a needle biopsy of the mass in view of the possibility that it might be a treatable, non-cancerous process. Unfortunately, my fears and theirs were realized when the lesion was malignant. Ben was uninterested in the biopsy result, and he was sent home with medication for pain. I had not heard from him for a year when he returned to my office accompanied by his daughters. He looked thin, drawn, and breathless but he maintained his sweet smile and he greeted me warmly. His pain was now worse and he had developed a large collection of fluid in his chest cavity. It was clear that he was near death. Given the absence of therapeutic options, I suggested to his daughters that their father return home with hospice care, which would maximize his comfort and treat symptoms as they arose. His daughters consulted with their Orthodox rabbi who stated that all measures be taken to keep Ben alive and comfortable as long as possible. Every moment of life was considered sacred and if hospitalization could prolong his life, he should remain hospitalized and be treated aggressively. I offered the option of discharging Ben home with follow-up by home hospice, but the family declined. Rather than have his shortness of breath treated with doses of morphine as needed, at home under the supervision of a team of hospice professionals, his family requested that he stay in the hospital, have a chest tube inserted to remove as much fluid as possible and thereby alleviate his breathlessness and probably prolong his life. When asked about his preferences, Ben deferred to his daughters. A chest tube was placed and although his breathing temporarily eased, Ben remained uncomfortable and quickly became weaker. Despite the chest tube, his breathing soon became more labored, and I suggested to his daughters that he be allowed to pass away peacefully without placing a breathing tube in his throat, intubation, and connecting him to a respirator. After a long discussion among themselves and with their rabbi, it was concluded that since intubation would prolong Ben's life somewhat, 
they felt religiously compelled to request ICU transfer and ventilator support. At this point, I tried once again to gently ascertain Ben's wishes, but whenever the discussion became too specific, his response was, ask my daughters. As Ben's breathing became more labored and it was clear that he would die imminently, he was transferred to the ICU, intubated, and connected to a respirator. As we were intubating Ben, the thought occurred to me that he really was a gosace and that we were ignoring Rabbi Judah the Pious' admonition to avoid compelling a person not to die quickly. Ben was sedated for comfort and despite the ventilator, died a day later. His family agreed at the last moment not to attempt cardiac resuscitation when his heart stopped beating. Although one might be tempted to criticize the rabbi's decision to preserve Ben's life as long as possible while attending to his pain and shortness of breath, the importance of the concept of the sanctity of life in the Jewish religion cannot be overstated. Judaism is a religion that treasures every second of life. Although Judaism accepts the notion of a hereafter, the entire corpus of Jewish law and law focuses on life in this world and stresses the importance of sanctifying every moment of existence by carrying out good deeds, adhering to God's laws, and deriving as much happiness and pleasure as possible within the bounds of halakha. If a person can be left kept alive for one more day, that person might use that time to do a mitzvah, a, re a religious commandment, reflect on their life, do teshuvah, repentance, or pray to God. I also feel that the Holocaust continues to have a significant impact on the way many rabbis and Jewish laymen think about the sanctity of life, especially when confronting end-of-life issues. Because a mere 70 years ago, one out of every three Jewish men, women, and children on earth were murdered by the Nazis and their henchmen, the notion of the sanctity of life has been reinforced leading many rabbis to ordain that every moment of life, even as life is ebbing, be preserved by whatever means possible. Let us return to the concept of a goseis. Although the classical sources I quoted above admonished us not to prolong the dying process of a moribund person, we do not compel a person not to die quickly, there's a very important flip side to this ancient concept. The Talmud prohibits actions that are intended to hasten the death of a goseis, who is regarded as a living person in all respects. The Talmud enumerates such prohibited actions, as mentioned by Dr. Kindbrunner, one may not move the patient, close his eyelids, or bind his jaws, actions that should not be carried out until after death. The goseis was likened to a flickering candle, as you heard, which becomes extinguished with the slightest perturbation. Clearly, the rabbis warn physicians to beware of the temptation to extinguish the flickering candle of life by, for example, administering a higher dose of morphine than is necessary to alleviate suffering. When such drugs are used with the intent to hasten death, regardless of the humane motives of the physician or the family, this is clearly prohibited. It is a delicate balancing act indeed. Just as Rabbi Judah the Pious and the Talmud would seem to sanction if not require intentionally removing impediments to a peaceful, peaceful death of a goseis in order to avoid prolonging the dying process, that same goseis should not have his or her death intentionally hastened by actions of the physician or the family. The laws pertaining to a goseis would seem to indicate that there is a definite, if subtle, distinction in Judaism between an action to remove treatment that prevents a peaceful death and an action with the intent of hastening death, such as administering a drug to the patient to accomplish this goal. The tension between respecting the sanctity of life by prohibiting actions intended to hasten the death of a moribund patient and alleviating suffering by permitting the removal of machines or medicines that are impediments to a peaceful death is a frequent concern of every ICU physician. Thus, the concept of a goseis developed centuries ago by Jewish scholars would appear to be relevant and useful even today in end-of-life situations. Judaism's stance on physician-assisted suicide is clear given its attitude towards a goseis. If a, physician may do not do, if a physician may not do anything that will hasten the death of a moribund patient, one is obviously prohibited from prescribing a lethal dose of medication 
to allow a terminally ill patient who may still live for months to commit suicide. The changing values of our society, which are increasingly accepting a physician-assisted suicide, it is now legal in six states, are clearly contrary to the teachings of traditional Judaism. There are many other issues involving end-of-life medical ethics that are addressed in Jewish law. For example, issues of patient autonomy. Do patients have the autonomous right to refuse or, remu or remove life-sustaining treatment if they are not terminally ill? When is it permitted to withhold an attempt at resuscitation? Is a person dead by halach halachic criteria if they are brain dead? Is organ donation halachically permitted, etc., etc.? The genius of Jewish law has been the ability of the rabbis to deduce from classical texts over 2,000 years laws that pertain to everyday life. The foundation of Jewish jurisprudence is the Torah, the five books of Moses, which are the first five books of the Bible. The Torah is the constitution of Judaism. In addition to stories about the Jewish patriarchs and matriarchs and the miraculous exodus of the Jews from Egypt, the Torah contains hundreds of laws. Tradition states that it is the word of God and is immutable. It is the basis for the encyclopedic compendium of Jewish law known as the Talmud. Just as the United States Supreme Court justices base their decisions on our Constitution and on the myriad court decisions that have been rendered over the years of our country's existence, rabbis have, over 2,000 years, based their decisions on the Torah, the Talmud, and legal rulings of judges and scholars. And just as there are significant differences of opinion between our current justices, there is a liberal and a conservative wing and a moderate in between, so too there are rabbis who render decisions based on a liberal or a conservative rendering of ancient and more recent legal Jewish texts. Not only do individual rabbis differ on legal questions, but there are three major movements within Judaism that differ significantly in matters of law and theology. These movements are known as Orthodox, Conservative, and Reform Judaism. Orthodox Jews believe the Torah is the word of God and immutable. The basis of their legal rulings is the Talmud and the writings of recognized Jewish scholars over two millennia. They allow few, if any, changes to the ancient precepts. At the other extreme is the Reform Movement, which is numerically the largest of the three divisions in the United States. It is the most liberal of the three in terms of law and practice. Reformed Jews feel the Torah is the work of divinely inspired men, not the literal word of God, and therefore its laws can be changed while remaining loyal to the spirit of Judaism. Reform rabbis advocate the need for changes in order to modernize Jewish practice and maintain its relevance to Jews immersed in Western culture. The conservative movement in between uh, is more liberal than the Orthodox and more traditional than the Reform in matters of ideology and practice. These differences in doctrine play out in the attitudes of the three movements with regard to end-of-life practices. For example, reform and conservative rabbis tend to be more permissive in terms of the latitude allowed their members to withdraw or withhold life support, including artificial nutrition and hydration. They might stress the aspect of the laws of agosase that permit withdrawing an impediment to a peaceful death, whether a ventilator or a feeding tube. On the other hand, Orthodox rabbis stressing the sanctity of life will point to laws of agosase that prohibit any action that might hasten the death of a dying patient. In general, Orthodox rabbis, as you heard, make a distinction between withholding life support, which is passive and often permitted, and withdrawing life support, which is active and therefore prohibited. With regards to brain death, the reform and conservative movements accept brain death as a religious as well as a legal definition of death, while there is a split in the Orthodox movement between those rabbis who accept and those who reject brain death as consistent with a halachic definition of death. Many Orthodox rabbis, and Ben's rabbi must be counted among them, feel that medical technology has rendered the idea of a gosace obsolete. After all, they reason, if some patients who were formerly considered moribund can now have their moment of death delayed by medical technology or even reversed, how then can we decide who is a gosace? Is the concept still relevant in our technologically sophisticated ICUs? Permit me at this point some personal reflections as a physician and as a modern or more liberal Orthodox Jew. Perhaps because of my decades of exposure to the sometimes painful realities of patients dying in the ICU, I believe that the concept of a gosace remains relevant 
even in our modern medical centers. In answer to those in the Orthodox community who feel that the concept of a gosase is obsolete, I point to many ICU patients who death, whose death would be imminent without life support, who are comatose or severely obtunded, who suffer pain and indignity, and who have no chance of leaving the hospital alive. Might not such a patient rightfully be called a gosace, and should we not be allowed to remove medical impediments to a more peaceful death? Rabbi Judah the pious would no doubt insist that in assessing when a critically ill person crosses the line between possible survival and certain death, painstaking efforts must be made by physicians to ensure the accuracy of their prognoses. The concept of a gosace is helpful only insofar as the physicians caring for such a patient are mindful of the sanctity of life and assume the awesome responsibility of making an accurate prognosis with humility and skill. I therefore believe that even today, the concept of a gosace offers a clear lesson for doctors, patients, and families. In the coming decades, America will face an increasing number of end-of-life ethical issues, as many aged baby boomers will have access to ever more sophisticated medical technology that can prolong life, but will often prolong the dying process. The strains on our medical resources, especially in a country where 20% of its population dies in the ICU, will be great. But resource allocation is not the only nor the most important reason why we should recognize the wisdom of considering certain dying patients as a gosace and allow them a peaceful and dignified death. I have seen numerous examples of patients, Jewish and Gentile, whose final days, weeks, or even months have been marked by repeated invasive procedures, resuscitations, and diagnostic tests that have served only to prolong the dying process and subject their body to grievous deformities and indignities. The choice is not between the false specter of so-called death panels eager to pull the plug on a loved one and those who would use technology to prolong the suffering of dying patients. There is a way to respect the sanctity of life of a gosace while withholding or removing impediments to a peaceful death. But this requires physicians with wisdom, expert clinical judgment, skills of communication, and sensitivity to the value of life and the concerns of families. It also requires sensitive guidance from spiritual leaders who sometimes view death as an enemy rather than inevitable, and who should heed the wisdom of Ecclesiastes. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. Thank you.